Well, hello and uh, welcome everybody to the last uh, webinar of um, 2020 Filmscape Chicago. Uh, so I think that this is actually going to be a really great one today. Uh, I think you guys are, are tuning into a pretty interesting one here. You've got a lot of experience um, on the line here. So I think that uh, you guys are really going to get a lot of great information about this. A uh, couple of housekeeping bits. Uh, if you're going to be asking questions, please put those questions in the Q&A. We know that you're going to have questions. So if you put them in the Q&A, that gives us a better opportunity to see them, respond to them. Some of them will be answered live. Some of them will be answered uh, just in the Q&A. Um, but uh, just kind of ignore the chat. Uh, we're going to use the Q&A for any sort of questions. Um, also, this is set to last for about one hour. Uh, we're going to do our very best to keep it at an hour. We might go a little bit long, might go a little bit short. We'll see how it how it ends up. But uh, there is nothing else scheduled beyond this. So I uh, hope you guys can stick around if we do go a little bit long. Uh, the other thing is uh, the virtual trade show floor is still open. Uh, so that's open till four o'clock today. So after this one is done, you can still go to the virtual trade show floor. If you go to filmscapechicago.com, and then you are, as long as you are registered and logged in, you can scroll down and you'll be able to see all of the different uh, logos for all of the different exhibitors at Filmscape. If you click on each of those logos, it will take you to a specific page for that vendor uh, that is within the Filmscape uh, website. So it's, it's not gonna take you out to the, the vendor's own website. It's gonna take you to a specific page and those vendors have a lot of really interesting things that they've put up there specifically for Filmscape. So um, you'll see, I mean, there are tons of videos. Uh, for example, uh, there, there's a great one. Uh, CL Hobbs has about rigging a camera onto a car. And there are just, I think he has like a dozen videos of how that happens uh, with this spe specific system that he has. Uh, so it's really interesting information there. Some of the vendors also have live uh, Zoom uh, meetings that you can set up with them. So you'll have a little bit of time left. You can go to those. Uh, if you scroll down on some of them, you'll see you can set up a live Zoom webinar with them if you have questions for them or anything like that. So really, really great information there. Those uh, people who do have the, the live stuff set up uh, will be there until four o'clock today, central time. Um, but each of those websites will be set up um, for, for a long time. So you'll still be able to, to get all of the, the information that's there. So some really great information there. Okay, so you're not here to, to listen to me. Uh, you're here to listen to the, the great panel that we have for you today. Uh, so right now, I'm going to introduce you to Dan Lampkin. So Dan is a freelance second AD uh, based in Chicago. Uh, he has worked on a lot of stuff and I'm gonna let him tell you more about that kind of stuff and then he will introduce our panel. Uh, remember, put your questions in the Q&A and I'll be back at the end to say goodbye. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Hello, virtual Filmscape attendees. Uh, thanks for sticking with us to the end here. My name is Dan. Uh, I am a DGA member and second AD freelance based in Chicago, uh, currently working on commercials, but uh, previously I did uh, season one of Boxes Next last year as the key second. Um, I'm gonna briefly introduce our panel and we're just gonna each say one thing that we learned from being a production assistant. So um, I learned that uh, hard work and dedication, it really sounds corny, but it does pay off. Um, you can advance in this industry. So uh, Tyler, can you introduce yourself? Hi guys, I'm Tyler Ventura, also a second AD here in Chicago. Uh, I was with Dan on Next last recently. Um, one bit of advice one of my ADs gave me is that as production members and assistant directors, we do not use any equipment aside from our words, which we need to use with efficiency. Thanks, Tyler. Jordan Butler. Hi, I'm Jordan. I'm currently the Base Camp Additional Second AD on Chicago Med. Um, and one of the things I learned early on about this business was that it's always changing. Everything's changing. You can start with a plan and it can completely change by the end of the day. Um, I'm a planner and that kind of threw me off in the beginning, but um, as long as you stick with it and roll with the punches, you'll be good to go. And uh, I think Erica's next. 
Hi, uh, I'm Erica LeBlanc. Uh, I'm currently a PA on Fargo season four. And uh, a piece of advice that I got right before I started was that at some point in the day, uh, the spotlight's gonna fall on you and we can't move on until you complete whatever task that may be, whether it's keeping someone from walking in a lockup or taking a, a water out of a scene, wh whatever it is, at some point the spotlight's gonna fall on you. So you just have to be prepared uh, at all points. Rich? Great, so I'm Richard Lee. I'm currently a PA on Fargo as well, season four. Um, one of the things that I learned about being in the industry early on is always make sure to properly prioritize because you have to make sure you're on top of everything because you're always multitasking and it's up to you to decide what's the most important thing to have handled at the moment so that you can get things done. All, all excellent points. Thank you, Rich and Erica and Jordan and Tyler. Uh, we have a lot of wonderful things to cover today. I think the place that we'd like to start is just, so if you're showing up to set in any capacity, but as a production assistant, since that's what we're here talking about today, you have some work to do before you arrive. Um, and the first part of that that I want to touch on is just this idea that uh, being on time is late. So if the call time says 8 a.m. and you park your car at 8 a.m., you don't have a radio on, you don't know where you're supposed to report, you're sort of behind the eight ball. So Rich, can you just talk a little bit about why it's important to give yourself a, a, a little bit of time in the morning to get settled? Yeah, so it's important to give yourself a little bit of time in the morning so that you can know where everything's at, get settled in with yourself, know that you have everything that you need to get the day started. Um, you're gonna also wanna make sure to just kind of scout things out you don't always get a chance to like in the day find out where things are as the day is going on. So it's good to know where everything is beforehand. Uh, you want to make sure that you've eaten your breakfast, that you've looked at the map, that you've caught any corrections that need to be made on call sheets because sometimes things get missed. So you just want to make sure that you're aware and everyone else on your team is aware of what's happening before anybody's called, before you ever set foot on set. I think that's a great way to, to describe it. And I'll just briefly add from a personal standpoint, you know, if you want to make sure that you aren't rushed in the morning, you like to start slow, you want to get a cup of coffee, you like to use the bathroom before you start work, whatever your personal thing is that's going to set you up for success, you want to just arrive early enough to allow yourself to do that. Um, and then put your radio on when you're ready to work, either right at your call time or just before it. Um, Jordan, can you talk to us, sorry, actually Tyler, can you talk to us a little bit about what kind of tools and supplies uh, production assistants might want to bring to set that would help them? So for me, there's really one basic tool is a pen that a lot of people forget about. And I know it sounds simple, but a pen and a little notepad, a Sharpie, a highlighter, you'll be writing notes, maybe writing names on things, marking or labeling tape, uh, those few basic little tools go a very long way to keep you um, just uh, ready to work and ready to have just some simple things for tasks that your key set might ask you to do. Um, I know people like to take notes on phones too. That's fine as well. Um, I, I personally like having text chains uh, if it's not too big of a group with uh, the other PAs on what's going on. Um, but again, that needs to be managed in a way sometimes too. So it's not just, uh, it's the most important information that's put out through because we all get hundreds of texts and calls and stuff like that. But uh, being able to write down maybe some jobs that were rambled off to you by the key set PA on the walkie real quick, keep order of them, keep track in your mind. Cause you, being on set, there's so much happening at once uh, at least for me starting out. And even as an AD now, I take hundreds of notes. Um, they help me not forget things and keep track of things in my mind uh, when I may be pulled in several different directions at once. So aside from that, you have your walkie talkie. One other thing that's really inexpensive that you guys can get from Amazon, they're like 13 bucks, is a surveillance mic. And I think if Erica, you still have yours there, they can see what it looks like. Search on Amazon surveillance uh, headset. You've probably seen them plenty of times, but you wearing one of these to work because they're pretty expensive and places like Comdirect don't really rent them out as much, um, puts you ahead of the game immediately. 
having that surveillance mic in your head and not having to be on the big BK set headset um, is just, uh, it'll make your bosses happy. There's a lot of conversations that happen on the walkie that are not meant for everyone to hear. Also being on open walkie on set, uh, number one, because you're shooting and the sound from the walkie, you know, once you're rolling, it's gonna ruin a take. And number two, like I said, um, the, the conversations that are had on one are not meant to be heard by all of production. Um, so I think uh, getting one of those is a great idea as well. Um, and then just wearing the appropriate gear, which leads kind of to the next point of checking the weather. And I'm gonna turn that over to Jordan to speak about. Hi guys. Um, so gear is one of my favorite things, which is why this is my section. Um, first and foremost, I would suggest always checking the weather. Um, I like to do it the night before and the morning of, just in case you know a storm or something came up in the night. Um, you don't want to be the one unprepared PA who needs to borrow a jacket or something from someone. I suggest um, always keeping some extra things in your car. I'll address that more a little bit later. Um, to start, always wear closed-toed shoes on set because my first day on a set, I wore Chacos and it was frowned upon. So closed-toed shoes are a must um, for your safety, of course. And then um, always be prepared to have a few pounds of walkie on your belt um, or on your waistband. Um, personally, I love to be comfortable with what I wear to work and I love wearing leggings to work, ladies. But um, I highly suggest having pockets, or if you do want to wear leggings, wear a fanny pack um, is always a good go-to to have somewhere to clip your walkie and have somewhere to keep your call sheet. Um, and just, you know, yeah, look at that. Erica's got her fanny pack. She's modeling for us. <laughs> um, let's see, pockets are incredibly helpful. I always keep an extra pair of socks in my backpack. I know it sounds kind of goofy, but um, if you step in a puddle or something happens, having wet feet is literally the worst. So highly suggest that. Um, another really good thing to keep in mind or to go ahead and invest in is some rain gear, um, especially if you're in Chicago or somewhere that has a lot of different uh, weather patterns that show up throughout the year. Um, I highly recommend a good rain jacket or a poncho. Longer rain jackets are good to keep your walkies dry. Um, which is one of the biggest issues that we have with walkies, which Rich will probably talk about later, um, is that they get wet and they stop working and they're expensive. So that's always something to keep in your mind. Um, I, have, I have a North Face rain jacket that I love. It goes down almost to my knees and it kind of flares at my waist. Um, so that's really helpful to keep everything dry. Um, waterproof shoes, rain boots for ladies. I have a pair of super cheap Crocs rain boots I keep in my car. Um, just in case. Neos are a great investment. Tyler swears by them. Um, they have rain versions and snow versions, um, depending on what you want them for. I have the rain versions. I love them for both. Um, the snow ones are super insulated. They're really helpful for the winter. Uh, you don't have to worry about stepping through puddles or anything. They're super waterproof and they go over your shoes. Um, so you don't have to bring an extra pair of shoes. Tyler, please. That's all I was going to say, just yeah. what they actually are. That they They're go over shoes. Yeah. Yeah. You can slide the ton of shoes or whatever you're comfortable wearing in them. Uh, so they're really nice to not have to take off your shoes and put a new pair of shoes on. Um, like I said, you can get them on Amazon. Check the sizes. I ordered a men's size 12 when I first ordered my pair. So make sure you check that. Um, let's see. Rain pants are also really nice to have. You can find them super cheap. Um, Academy, I don't know if you guys have those up here, but they have super cheap, like $15 pairs of rain pants. I've had them for years and they're great. Um, and then I also really like to keep a towel, like a mic, like one of those little camping microfiber towels um, in my pocket, partially for my glasses. You know, when it's downpouring, your hands get wet, you're trying to do walkie stuff. It's just kind of nice to have in your pocket. Um, and then snow gear. Uh, this is a question that I actually get a lot from PAs that are new because it can be brutal being outside in the winter in Chicago for several hours um, and trying to stay safe. So I highly suggest good base layers. Icebreaker has really good ones. You can find them on sale at REI Garage Sales or Amazon has great ones too. 
Um, they make all the difference. I suggest the pants and the long sleeve shirts. Um, wool socks are great. You can wear two pairs. Sometimes I do inside my boots. Um, bibs are also great. Bibs are like the ski pants that also have the little overall straps. Um, they're great. They can go over your clothes, over your base layers, and whatever else you wear. Um, they're sized big usually so that you can take them off if you're switching sets. If you're going inside, it's a really easy way to put on another layer. Um, Carhartt, I have a Carhartt one that I absolutely love. They have the quilted ones, um, but I know that all kinds of ski brands also sell really good ones. Um, another thing that I learned was that hats and scarves are necessities, not accessories, because you absolutely 100% need to wear a hat and scarves when you're going to be outside for a long time. Um, will make all the difference. I also suggest glove liners, which I know for some of us is, was kind of a new thing for me coming from the South. Um, but having that lighter pair underneath a thicker pair of gloves is really nice and will keep your fingers nice and toasty. Um, and I highly suggest getting the gloves with the tech fingers because um, like Tyler mentioned before, you probably will be using your phone quite a bit, I would say, for PAs um, with text chains and answering phone calls, especially if you're on location. Um, so that's really helpful. Um, I like to keep a bag of weather gear in my car just in case. Um, like I said earlier, checking the weather, sometimes things pop up and you just don't know. So um, I have a duffel bag in my trunk. I have two pairs of socks, one regular pair for normal days and a pair of wool that I have just dedicated to that bag. I never take them out unless I wear them. Um, I have an extra scarf. I have a pair of gloves. Um, when I upgraded to my longer rain jacket, I just kept my older one in that bag. Um, I've loaned it out to PAs who have needed it before. Um, or if I just, you know, totally space and forget mine, I always have a backup. Um, you could also put a poncho. Those little trash bag ponchos are really easy to store and helpful in a, in a bind. Um, I also keep my rain pants, an extra hat in that bag, um, and then I keep my Neos and my little pair of rain boots in my trunk, um, just in case, because you never know what can happen. So um, that's my spiel on gear. So Thank I you, Jordan. Can I, I, was... can I add something? Yes, please, please Erica. Um, with shoes, wear shoes that make your feet very happy, because you're going to be standing for 10 to 12, 13, 14 hours. Um, make sure your feet are happy because if yeah. your feet are happy you're happy you don't want to be unhappy you know I agree I have a really good pair of um Hoka tennis shoes that I actually did get at REI garage sale on sale and yeah. they're great so yeah I highly suggest investing in some really nice you know good pairs of shoes thank you very much Jordan and Erica I I had an AD once tell me um, change your socks at lunch I thought he was joking but no you'll be very ha happy the thing that I think sum up what Jordan is saying in this section is just to be prepared to think like a boy scout or a girl scout be self-reliant and prepared for whatever environment our factory to use a term changes locations every day so one day we're going to be in an office downtown the next day you're on a stage the next day you're in a rock quarry the next day you're in a swamp so kind of knowing where you're going and dressing accordingly and being prepared for everything is um is part of the game plan so that leads us to our next section, which Erica is going to sort of talk about the different areas of a set and uh, how to read a map and, and sort of describe beyond just the physical shooting area, what to look for. Yeah, so um, with a call sheet every night, which is the schedule, somebody will go into detail on that later. Um, the call sheet will come with a map and a map will cover not only where we're shooting, but also where parking is, where uh, lunch will be and breakfast, uh, if there's a second set that we're moving to where the working trucks are. So it, it really covers everything. Um, so it's really important. What I do is I check it the night before to see how far away parking is from set. So that way I know that travel time when I come in, it'll help to de uh, determine what time I try to land at parking. Um, you should always find out as well from your uh, key PA or your AD where you're supposed to meet in the morning. So you know, when you get to crew parking, am I supposed to be going to breakfast? Am I supposed to be going to set? Am I supposed to go to base camp? Um, so those are good things to know beforehand. But um, 
you should always be paying attention to uh, where everything is, not only for yourself, but uh, there's a lot of crew. There's maybe over a hundred people usually at any given time. And, you know, they, they get the same information that you do. They have access to all the same information you do, but they, their jobs don't necessarily require that they need to know it at all times. And they're, they're going to ask you where something is and you should have that answer. Um, and if you don't know, you're going to find out. That's, that's the rule. I don't know is not an answer. I'll find out is the answer. Um, so always knowing where things are uh, is helpful overall to keep the day running smooth. In the morning, it's great to go in and know, uh, sorry, I got confused. Um, it's, it's great to go in and uh, get eyes on everything to know, all right, breakfast is over here. This is where we are filming first. Um, from this filming location, this is where the bathrooms are. Uh, you should know where Crafty is going to set up. Crafty uh, is the snacks and, and food basically at hand uh, for the day for people who don't know what Crafty is, craft services. Um, to know where all that stuff is, where the water is, because uh, some people can't pull away from set and sometimes it's up to you. They'll ask for some help to get them uh, water or a snack and you're just kind of a, a go-between um, if you have a chance to run away. Uh, another important thing is um, being aware, like f to give an example, um, the other day we were filming and we have a, a location for an emergency shelter. So if there's bad weather, this is where we go. On the map, it didn't give an address. So knowing that that's something I'm going to get asked, I talked to locations, I made sure that they spoke with the AD so that way during our safety meeting, that information could get out there and we wouldn't be stuck when inevitably, which we did have a downpour and lightning. So we had to, we had to run high. So just being aware of all of those little things just helps the day run so much smoother. So you're, you're thinking ahead and you're prepared for moments that could really hold up the day. Um, so those are some of the, the important things. Um, uh, do you guys have anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, I think that, thank you, Erica, that's going to lead us into our next section where we kind of show some of this paperwork. Sure. I will just um, add that, like Erica's giving this wonderful example about the map, didn't say the address, so she asked and then she told the AD staff, hey, there's no address for this, but here's what it is. Um, there are hundreds of things happening, and much as everyone tries to have all the T's crossed and I's dotted, there's no such thing as a stupid question. So right. as long as you're reading the documents that you've been provided and using your brain, then any PA, whether you're the 30th additional or the key set PA, can ask a question that leads to success. Like Erica is suggesting, um, you, we can talk a little bit later on about knowing how and when to ask those questions so that you're not jumping in the middle of like the director's trying to explain something. But um, yeah, thinking on your feet and being proactive is a big part of, of yeah. what happens on set no matter what department you're in and I think being a production assistant um, you can learn how to be successful in other departments so um, that being said we're going to move on to a section about just like looking at paperwork and um, I hope we can see this call sheet that I'm sharing from the show that we did last year so every show is going to be different um, a big studio show or a movie is going to have a lot more information than maybe an indie movie or commercial or a student film but in general, your call sheet's gonna have the general crew call up here at the top, the date and uh, weather information, things like that. Then um, emergency information somewhere on the front of the call sheet. Again, they're all designed slightly different, but like where the hospital is, probably where parking is, a safety phone number. And then moving down, you'll have like a description of the day's work. Here's the different scenes we're doing and their page counts. Uh, here's the location. Then you'll see, again, every second 80 is different. So there would be these little breakout bubbles with information, things they're trying to explain to you. And then um, these cast ID numbers correlate down here to this next section, which is the cast. Um, and then it has their role and their name and says whether they're working or this is their last day or H as a whole means they're not working that day. Fit means fitting. Um, and it shows what time they show up on for hair and makeup and then what time they're expected on set. 
and then sort of uh, any other notes. So looking at sort of their set report times can give you a sense of the schedule. Like you may be wondering, well, what time are we packing the trucks to move to Cinespace? Okay, well, cast ID number two is in the first scene over there and they got him on set at 11. So if crew call is nine, then wow, we're really only at that first location for a quick second. And you can also use these page counts over here uh, on the right, that'll give you a sense of how long each scene is. And then going down, you'll see the same information for background that you see for cast. And then these shooting notes by department, which you can peruse. Oftentimes the departments will have other information that's not listed here, but it's sort of a way for the AD department to say, hey, we talked to you about this thing. You said you're gonna have this thing. Here's our confirmation that you're gonna have this thing. So that either the thing is there or it isn't, it's sort of a, a CYA, pardon my French, cover your ass. So we talked to the grips about having this green screen. They know about it. It's not gonna be a surprise to them. Here's like the picture cars. The Teamsters have said they're gonna bring these picture cars. And then they'll look at that and say, oh, no, we don't actually have that car. Usually there's a preliminary call sheet that'll come out sometime during lunch, maybe a little after. And the point of the preliminary call sheet is to uh, work through all of the issues that are presented for the next day and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Call sheet is really just a document. The purpose of making the document is to come up with all the answers for the next day that will lead you to a successful shoot day. So as the second AD, if I'm making the call sheet and I have to put in where lunch is, then I have to call the locations person and make sure we know where lunch is and that like that jives with what the transpo guys think and that makes sense with what my UPM and first AD think and so on down the line. Then you'll see the advanced schedule, which is sort of just a peek at the next day's work. Um, not the day that we're doing, but what's happening tomorrow. Again, for conversation purposes. And then on the back, you're gonna see uh, information for each department. So ADs are usually up in this top left-hand corner. You'll see your uh, name and your individual call time. So that's important to check because you're gonna wanna make sure if crew calls eight, well, you may need to be in at six or 6.15 or something like that. Um, the other thing that is in a call sheet usually, what uh, Erica was talking about is like a map. So like, here's the map. It's got where breakfast is, where crew parking is, the first set, the second set, lunch, holding, etc. cetera. Um, it's a good visual aid. And then there's usually directions and addresses and things like that. And then sometimes if there's a company move, like moving from one physical set to another, it'll list all that information as well. Sometimes that won't be included, it'll get handed out later. And then I just briefly wanna show everybody kind of what a one line schedule looks like. If you're working on a TV show or a movie, you probably get one of these. It's sort of like, uh, they call it a strip board. Back in the day, it used to actually be like physical pieces of paper. Um, it just sort of runs down the bold points of what's on the call sheet. So not a detailed breakdown, but just here's the location, here's what we're doing, here's the scene number, here's the cast that are required so that we can then reference our scripts. And then there are more detailed shooting schedules um, and something called a day out of days, which will take individual cast members or elements and show you which days in the schedule they're working. So um, we don't need to spend a, too much of a time on this. I just wanted everyone to sort of get a sense of what a call sheet looks like and what um, a schedule looks like. Um, it sounds like communication with other, we have a couple of questions. It sounds like a communication with other departments is key to create and read a call sheet. How do you collect all this info to send to cast and crew? So in preparation, um, the department heads and the first AD are constantly having meetings and the first AD is constantly taking that inf information, hopefully if they're a good first AD, um, which is why they got hired. They're taking all those notes and they're putting it into what they call the breakdown, which can generate different documents, can generate that schedule document, can generate, if you just wanna look at what cars are working on Tuesday, you can see it and it'll tell you. Um, so that's a big part of it and having phone calls and meetings. And then again, sending out the prelim call sheet. It's a constant conversation. What do we think is happening? What does other departments think is happening? No, it's not a briefcase, it's an attache case. Uh, has the director approved it? No, we're not having a case anymore, it's a backpack. There's no more extras, we cut all the extras, or we added 20 people, 
that's a big part of being an AD is like if things change, not just assuming other people know the answer, but just making sure that um, that they that you're constantly asking questions and, and getting the conversation. Um, Tyler, would you like to talk a little bit about some other uh, paperwork that you may see as a PA? Sure. I think there's some good basic ones that I have a few um, examples of. I'm just going to show them up. I'm here. I'm not going to screen share. So you have this is time card. Um, this is what most of them look like. Um, the difference between this and what we call a daily or a daily timesheet, uh, the daily is for the week. Um, and basically, this is something that the daily will be filled out every day by the other departments such as grip, camera, electric, props, set deck, all the shooting departments that has their times on it for the day that gets collected by the PAs at night or the end of the shooting day and then handed to the second AD or whoever's doing the production report. Without going into the production report too much, it's a legal document that will uh, that's usually done in Excel, sometimes Doxilla on the Fox shows. And that's something the second second works on at the end of the night. It's all the out times for all the departments and a bunch of other wrap information basically. So at the end of the night, a lot of responsibility on the PAs to collect these from all the departments. These are the daily sheets, you give them to the second AD. So he knows the times to put in. They're from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So they're not been doctored. They're from that specific department, what they wrote down. The time card is how people get paid. So Friday, whatever the end of your work week is, in addition to the daily timesheet for Friday, you get a whole bunch of these from each department. And those go to the office. This is how they get paid. This is how a regular crew member gets paid. Um, we use military time. If you're not familiar with it, uh, you should learn it. It's pretty simple, basically. It starts 12.0 um, is noon. Uh, 0, 0.0 is 12 midnight. So 1.0 is 1 a.m. and it goes forward till 12. So you just kind of have to memorize the numbers and what they go with. Like seven o'clock is 19.0, eight o'clock 20.0. You'll just start learning them in your head. The other part of the decimal, not that I mean to go into all of this, it goes by sixes every six minutes. So Look up military time. That's how people put their times in, into here. Um, uh, just briefly, I shared a link in the chat for everybody that has an understanding of it. But basically, like if you're after midnight, like let's say you're in a two two p.m. call time because you're shooting overnight, and you go till the next morning, it just keeps going. So going. one a.m. would be twenty five hundred. Two a.m. would be twenty six hundred. Given that you started the and it keeps going. You'll need to know that if you work on a Michael Mann movie, because they don't stop, they just keep going. <laughs> they, these kids don't know who Michael Mann is. Yeah, oh, you're right. Can I make a note on that really quick? Um, about the click, the, the decimal that we use, it's by six minutes because you're dividing the hour into tenths. Correct. Um, so it's six, 12, 18, 24, and so on. Um, if you look up accounting time, that's what that's considered if you need a refresher on that later. Right on. Um, yes, Rich has got that handy dandy. Look at that, Rich. Rich for the win. I used to carry the PA. I used to have laminated versions of those in my kit for PAs. So it's like the uh, multiplication tables. You just learn it. Yeah. You just memorize it. And learn you'll it. hear people say, What time was official lunch? And no one will say two to three. They'll say 14.0 to 15.0. Um, there's lots of little. I guess this is maybe a good opportunity to say there's lots of like jargons and shorthands for things, um, which we can get into at the end. But I would just say, and it kind of goes back to what Jordan was saying with the gear earlier. Don't, don't be intimidated, you know, ask questions, learn things. Don't, don't let uh, the cool film set people push you around in your own mind. You know, if you don't have all the gear on your first job, that's fine. Nobody, it's mostly about making sure you can stay dry or warm. It doesn't really matter what you have. And um, going along with the questions note, your key set PA is a great resource if you have questions. They're usually gonna be your point of contact anyway. Um, so especially when you're a newbie, go to them first with questions and if they can't answer, then they'll direct you to someone else that can. Yes. 
I'd like to say too, sometimes it's hectic on set. If you've worked, you know that. They don't have time to answer your question right now. Find a time later when it's not as hectic. I think more than enough, good ADs and good key seconds will be more than happy to explain to you why something's done in a certain way. They may just not have the time. And that's the difference, you know, between like teaching someone to work um, in film because there's a lot of uh, work that's getting done behind the scenes, um, I guess is what I'm trying to say. As far as, um, you know, an AD giving you an order, you might not understand right away, so. I think like what Tyler's touching on, and we'll get to this in a, with Rich here, we're gonna talk about radios here next, but um, there's an order of operations to the set in terms of how the set itself functions, but also how the AD department functions and even within the production assistant uh, chain of command. So one time when I was a PA, someone, another PA said to me like, this is a neck down operation. And I took offense to it because I was like, well, no, we have to use our brains. Like Erica is saying, we have to ask smart questions. But there's a point to that, which is like, you may have a way to do it, but the way that you're being asked to do it by the person who hired you or who is above you, that's sort of more what you're asked to do, is to put your own opinions and ego aside and just do the task, because we're all one collective unit. When we get into our own personalities, we start worrying about how we want to do things and working at cross purposes, which we're all human beings, we're all capable of doing, things start to fall apart. So. On that note, Rich, can you talk about proper set communications, radios, why we have them and how we use them so that we can function as one unit? Yes. So as you guys have heard throughout this conversation, communication is key. Like you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to communicate properly and effectively. The one way we do that is our walkie talkies. Now, with your walkies, that's like one of your most valuable tools on set. You're gonna use that for pretty much all your day-to-day -day communication, unless like you're near someone, you can talk to them face-to-face, -face, which is good, but you don't always get that luxury. So the first thing to know about your walkie is that you have 16 channels on every walkie. On the main channel is channel one, which is where most of the crew and most of the departments, they are all on that channel for the most part. Uh, and with that, everything that you say on walkie is heard by everyone. So you, make, you must make sure that you're careful about what you're saying. And it's also, like I said, you wanna stay efficient with it so that you're not bothering people with extended conversations because everyone is using this channel and everyone is trying to say something usually at the same time. Um, with that, you wanna make sure you have your headset, which we spoke about that earlier. Because if you don't have a headset, once again, think about all the people that are on set and how many people are trying to talk all at once that could definitely interfere with filming on set. Um, you want to make sure that you look at the call sheet, you know who's on what channel, usually on the call sheet on the back of it. There are departments labeled and they have a number next to the department, which tells you if it's on channel one, two, three, four, you know, all the way to channel 16. Other things about walkie etiquette when you're on there. So there's channel two, the channel one and channel two are for PAs and AD staff usually. So channel two is the channel that you go to to talk about things that aren't dire to set immediately. Or if you wanna have a separate conversation about something or need to get more specific details, you would take it to two. Other things about walkie, channel three. It's usually a channel that our um, transportation department lives on, usually. It varies from show to show, but a lot of the times you'll get transport on that, that channel. And there's a whole like etiquette of talking with the transportation department. You can't just get on walkie and you know, say, hey guys, I need a ride and expect everyone to show up. What you have to do is you have to properly address people. And this goes for every channel. You just wanna be more polite with the transportation department. Uh, they're a little sometimes, I don't know, those guys can be testy. Um, but what you wanna do is you state your name, you say, hey, this is so-and-so, I'm, I'm Richard Lee. Um, at this location and I'm calling for a ride for this person to drop off at this location. So you're telling them all the information they need. You're telling them who they're talking to, who they're picking up, where to pick up and where to drop off. Hey Rich, yeah, I have a question. question. Yeah, yes. if I go on the Transpo channel, what's the first thing I should do before I say anything? Before you say anything, you should listen to make sure they're not saying anything. You always gotta check every channel, make sure no one's talking on the channel first and then you speak. Same for channel one. 
it's a good thing to listen always be listening to your walkie because you'll get people that go to different channels they'll call people to a separate channel and then if you're not listening you can miss that and you'll go to that channel as well and if you don't listen beforehand you'll start to talk over those people and you don't want that because the one thing that bothers everyone is static in the ear cutting people off like you you just need to be aware um if you do cut somebody off you definitely hear about it <laughs> uh and also like you just want to avoid those type of things those are mistakes that are easily avoided another thing that you want to do with your walkie is just be aware of your um your headset so that you're not accidentally pressing the button because you don't want to key and keying is just a term that we use like when your button is constantly mashed down and everyone is listening to your entire conversation they're hearing everything that you're saying and you're not even aware of it a lot of the times um when that happens most of the PAs tend to scramble on set to find out who the person is that's keying to let them know, hey, like you're interrupting the channel right now. You got to be mindful of your walking. Um, one note, one note on keying is if you it's if you turn your radio on and then plug your headset in, most likely you will have an open mic for whatever reason you need to plug your headset in, then turn your radio on, which you'll get a little beep in your ear and that'll let you know your headset's working. So, okay, thanks for it continue. That's true. Another good thing to do too is when, once you plug in your walkie, like at the beginning of the day, first thing you do, just do a walkie check. Say, hey, walkie check. And if someone responds, that means that you transmitted, they heard you and they're transmitting back to you and you heard them. It's a good way to check your walkie. If you ever hear walkie silence where you don't hear anything, it's always a good time like just to do a quick check. Make sure that you are still, your walkie still functioning properly. Because there are times where you, you, know, you might miss it, your battery might die. Um, you know, something could be wrong with the walkie. You just never know. So in those moments, you know, just do a quick check. Hey, just checking. If somebody replies back, then you know your walkie is still functioning properly. Um, with that being said about the batteries, make sure you have extra batteries always available to yourself. As a PA, you should have it for yourself and for other crew members. Therefore, if anybody on set has a dead walkie, you can easily swap the battery out with that person. And you always want to have at least two. I like to carry two, if not more. That's just my personal preference, but always have one. That way you can have something available for anyone who needs it. Uh, what else? Always, if you can, bring an extra headset for yourself or maybe for another person. You know, you might have a teammate who needs, whose headset breaks and they want to use another one. You have something to offer, you know, to your, your peers. Other things about walkie etiquette. Uh, I can go on this for days because I, I, I've done walkies for quite yeah, some time. Maybe we'll them. all just chime in briefly. <laughs> I will say, speaking as an AD, especially on a job where there's like additional PAs, just keep your words concise. Like, like Rich was saying, take someone to channel two and have a more extended conversation. Even if it's like, hey, Rich, your staff, I'm a day player. I don't know where the whatever is. Don't have that conversation on channel one. You would just say, Rich, lead channel two, please. Then you would switch channels and then wait for Rich and have that conversation. Um, if an AD is talking to you, and you're gonna copy the first AD if he says, all right, I need a PA on the corner of State and Madison. There's a guy in a red shirt. We need to get him out of the shot. If you just say copy, it doesn't do anyone any good. You say like, this is Dan, I'm on Madison approaching State. I see the guy in the red shirt, copy. Like you give a, a description of it, um, is helpful. And then can someone talk about what a lockup is and how we confirm we're locked up? I think would be good. Sure, Dan, I'll feel that one. Uh, and yeah, to echo what you just said about walkies, the important thing, it's a, it's a radio, not a television. So you kind of have to be a little bit more precise on where you are and what you're doing within reason with not over talking on the walkie. Um, saying I'm over here doesn't help anyone. I'm on the southwest corner of Madison and state. Yeah. That, that's more helpful. Um, so basically, one of the first things that I ever did when I was, uh, when I started out was just big lockup days for stunts. There'd be 30 PAs, we'd be locking up one stretch of road down Wacker or something like that while a stunt car drove through. Basically, you're uh, present but out of the shot somewhere, kind of hiding and uh, keeping the set locked up while they're rolling from the crew and other pedestrians. Again, working on the stage is different than working out in, you know, the loop or somewhere like that where you have to deal with the general public. Um, and my quick note on that is just always be professional when speaking to the public, always be nice. 
you know, if it's not something that's super secret, what you're filming, just say, hey, my name's Tyler. I'm a production assistant. We're shooting for a movie here right now. Do you mind holding here for just a moment while we finish the shot? Once we cut, we'll be able to let you through. That little bit of professionalism versus like, stop, halt. Don't come through here. We're filming a movie. You're not an authority. You're not the cops. You're, you know, you're a production assistant working for a movie. I see that um, not as often anymore, but coming up that made the difference between, between someone who is successful negotiating the public in a space and controlling them versus someone who lost control immediately and, you know, would have blown lockups. Can I, can I uh, add to that? Um, the, the thing I hear most often is that we're, wherever we are, if we're filming on a location somewhere, we're a guest in their neighborhood or their space. So when they come up to you, you're the, you're the hindrance. You're the one who's the problem. So you have to address it, at, like Tyler said, very kindly. A, a one, a go-to I have, especially on Fargo, it takes place in the 1950s. People love it when I say, uh, uh, we can't have you walk through this set. You're not dressed like you're from the 50s. And they're like, oh, that's, that's great. I'm not. Uh, they, they love little things like that. Or, or like, this is a winter scene. You don't look like you're dressed for the winter. And they're like, oh, gosh, you're right. I'm not. Uh, so whatever way you can kind of placate people and make them feel like, oh, right. OK, I'm a part of this is, is always helpful. I want to just echo what Erica is saying and what Rich was saying is that um, kindness and courtesy go a long way. There's a lot of uh, reputation about a film set, especially about ADs and just tyrants and people yelling and big egos. My experience is that the people who succeed, there are exceptions to this rule, but they tend to be very courteous and very polite. A lot of yes sirs and no ma'ams and copies and pleases and thank yous will get you a long way. Whether you're dealing with the security guard who's in parking or you're dealing with the to head a production from the studio that you're working for who happens to be on your set or a multi-million dollar actor who is day playing on your show for one day. I was going to say, Dan, I think that's, if, oh, sorry. The this department or not. Go ahead, Tyler. Sorry, it was, uh, your screen was cutting out. Um, what you said too, if you're a new PA, you might not know every single producer or actor or anyone that's approaching set. So it just, it behooves you to be rude to people. You may not know who you're talking to that's approaching set. Just to add to that, Tyler, uh, if you don't know who everybody that's on set, it's still good. Just, you know, ap approach everyone. Like if there's a person coming to set that you don't know if they're supposed to be there or not, just, you know, initiate, engage conversation with those guys so you can find out who they are and if they need to be there. I, I've been on set plenty of times where I've stopped producers from walking into set because I had no clue that they're the producer, you know. Sure. And, and that's instead your, of getting that was your job, right? You were probably locking up that shot, and they're not on exactly, radio, so they don't know you're rolling. So you were doing your job, exactly. And and no one gets frustrated about that. They're actually happy that you're doing your job. Um, I and I would say in a, in addition to that, uh, that when you get to set and you don't know the some of the major people on it. I always look up actors I don't know the night before on a call sheet, so that way I can be helpful. If I see one wandering over to Crafty, I can let somebody know. Um, and then when you get to set, knowing visually who the director is, who the first AD is, who the DP is, the director of photography. So when they walk away or the first AD asks, where's the director? You can you know, look around and know what you're looking for. Um, always helpful. I'm just gonna briefly take 60 seconds and explain what a lockup is for those who don't know. So things are a little different now that we're in COVID times, which we're gonna to touch on, but in general, a lockup is we are out in the public with a film crew uh, attempting to establish a set and control an environment. And we need production assistance help to uh, identify and reposition, redirect uh, the general public. You should never, ever, ever, ever be asked to deal with live traffic. If you're a production assistant and you're on a show, an indie movie, a commercial, a music video, whatever, and someone above you asks you to control traffic, that is the job for police and law enforcement. It is not our job. Um, also, just know that you never physically touch anyone. You wanna like use your words, you wanna be polite like we're saying, but if somebody doesn't wanna stop, you don't stop them, you call it out. Guy in a green shirt, southbound on Michigan Avenue, he didn't wanna stop. Bicyclist, northbound on state, not stopping. 
just call it out and leave it alone. Um, I will also say that, especially now in COVID times, just hopefully your show has some kind of security quadrant, so you're not actually interacting with the public. But if you're on a commercial or an indie movie where that is the case, you're going to want to make sure that you're just masked and giving people the proper distance and just being aware of whatever environment you're in. And if you have questions or you feel unsafe, you need to raise your hand. Like we, we shoot night shoots, we shoot Shameless. I know all of us have worked on Shameless and you're in certain neighborhoods at night. You know, if you don't feel comfortable being on this corner, you need to say something. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'd like to say that too. As a, as a starting PA, I was so excited to be on set that I was nervous to um, uh, tell anyone that I felt unsafe. So um, absolutely, as a PA, you, if you are asked to control live traffic or if you're in an alley that you feel unsafe, don't be afraid to say, you know, take your key PA aside and say, hey, I'm, you know, apologies, but I really don't feel comfortable doing that. Is there somewhere else that I could be more beneficial? Or, you know, how do we address the situation? So don't be afraid to, to speak your mind about those things. I think, and, go okay. ahead, Erica. No, go ahead. Um, I would say in uh, going along with feeling comfortable enough to speak up about your own safety, um, sometimes when you're in a lockup, it's because we have cars moving on the road or, you know, a big, some big move happening with equipment or people and it's dangerous. So if somebody does walk through the set and you're, you think like, oh no, this is my fault. They walk through, they wouldn't listen to me. You have to say something to maintain their safety and the safety of the actors or the crew, whoever's uh, driving, whatever it may be, because I've, I've done that once where I didn't say anything and somebody got through and they almost got hit by a car. Like it's, you gotta be very, very careful and comfortable to speak up because they would rather ruin a take by a PA saying we have to stop this take than killing somebody. <laughs> to, to Erica's note though, you should never say cut on the radio. That's not your job. You should, you, you can identify the problem, but don't, don't use that word because sometimes we're doing stunt work or precision driving or whatever. And those people may also be on that channel. If you say that word, they may stop at a point that where it's actually more unsafe for them. So again, just identifying what's happening and calling it out is important. I would say someone told me once face the threat, not the set. So like a lot of times we're doing cool stuff. We want to watch, like I want to see the truck blow up or I want to see the Russian arm drive by with the Ferrari or whatever it is. But if I'm, watching that i'm not watching you know the public and making sure that they're at a safe distance so um I think can i add one more thing to that yeah please rich go ahead yeah, just uh when dealing with the public like yeah we want to if we can you know have them wait a lot of people don't tend to want to wait so if you can't get them to just wait just delay them as much as you can and I find that like, that's easiest to do. Like if a person is arguing, they're mad, they want to go past, they're like, oh, I don't have to stand, stand here. Just keep communicating with them. And like, while you're doing that, they're not realizing that they're waiting anyways. And by, that, by the time that the scene is over with, like they'll call cut and you're like, okay, well now you can go about your way. You know, just simple things like that could help out so much like, just with your lockups and everything. And um, I'll let you guys go. I just want to say, don't leave a lockup. If someone puts you in a lockup and you got to go to the bathroom, you need to go get a drink of water, your mom's sick, somebody says, hey, can you help me with this other thing? Please take the person who put you in that lockup to channel two and ask to be replaced before you walk away. Thank you very much. Speaking for all ADs everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, and something that I find really beneficial is to know your, I know that you guys touched on this, but um, cardinal directions when you're outside. I am completely directionally challenged. I have no sense of direction whatsoever. But when you get put in a lockup, if you look at, I mean, use your phone compass. If you, it's really a lot easier to identify potential problems. If you can say, like Dan said, uh, you know, bike coming southbound on State Street or whatever, it's really helpful because as Tyler mentioned, not a television, it's a radio. Yeah, saying things like over here, uh, nobody knows where you are. <laughs> you say, I have somebody right here next to me. Or, that's, that's not useful information. I will say, efficient. you can also ask, what is the shot? Like, don't necessarily ask on channel one, because you might get reamed out by an AD for no reason. But 
ask your other PA friends, uh, text the key set PA, which way is the camera looking? Hey, I've been on this corner for two hours. Are we still, do people still need to not come down this street? And they might go, oh, no, 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 we forgot to tell you. They can walk on that side now. So again, it goes back to what Erica was saying at the very beginning about like using your brain, asking questions. Those are the kinds of things that are gonna get you noticed as a PA, that are gonna get you rehired and, and it's just showing that you're in it and you're committed. Like you might be on the furthest of far lockups, but like if we can hear you on the radio every once in a while and we can tell you're in it, it's like, oh, who's that person? Is anybody, this kind of, we kind of went on a sidetrack. I don't wanna make sure we got, Tyler, yeah, do you have we, something you wanna add? I was just gonna say, do we wanna get back to some of the other jobs that PAs have? Um, yes, I think this is an staffers? excellent, this is an excellent segue into, so we've kind of talked about lockups, which is maybe what additional PAs will do. Um, but we'll just go into like staff PA overview, sort of what are all the positions. I'll just briefly list them. So typically, I mean, this can change on every show, but typically you have your key set PA, um, your first team or cast PA, your uh, base camp PA, and then your radio distro PA. Um, and then a background, some shows, a lot of shows will have somebody who's assigned to sort of helping check in and wrangle the extras. So, um, and then as far as AD staff, you'll always have your first AD, your key second AD, and your second second AD. A lot of shows will also carry one or more additional second ADs to oversee the production in various forms. So um, we'll just start at the top. So key set PA is on set. They work with the first AD and the second second AD. Tyler, you are our second second AD on next. Can you talk a little bit about being a key set PA and what is expected? So I think a good way to answer that question, when people ask me like, what, what do you do at your job? I like to say it's, it's what a stage manager does for a play. You're kind of, you have your hand in every bit of the production and you're there um, day to day facilitating that. So the, the second second in particular, uh, is usually more involved with what's happening right on set. So setting background, being a mouthpiece between the director and the first AD, communicating with the key set PA, and just overseeing his work and making sure that he's helping you uh, keep the places or the pieces uh, that need to be moved in place throughout the day. Um, it is a lot of sometimes feel like you're, you're overbearing because you're always constantly checking on people that they're doing their job. Or uh, again, you know, I guess things like that. But uh, do you want me to talk about uh, key set PA responsibilities? I think you're muted, Dan. Sorry, if you can just briefly, yeah, spend you know, sixty seconds describing so, the ideal key set PA. Well, but to me, what a key set PA is is someone that's almost ready to graduate to be an AD. This is the job where you're kind of the you're the boss PA. And it's your responsibility to manage the other PAs, mostly for lockups and keeping control of the set. All the other staffers have their own specific responsibilities. You'll need to ask them for help from time to time, but they also will be kind of doing their jobs. So you are more entwined with the additionals and working with the second second to make set run. Um, and one important thing we're gonna talk about with that is you're still a team. Um, there's a difference between doing, stepping on other people's toes and trying to do their jobs and being helpful and looking out for each other, which is something, you know, just find your groove as you're working with a team over, you know, the amount of time a show is on. So like Erica mentioned earlier, like, hey, I see an actor that's wandering off to craft. He doesn't look like anyone noticed him. Help the first team PA call that out. Be like, hey. John's going over to Crafty, or hey, he told me he's going 10-1. Simple things like that um, are super helpful to the PA whose responsibility that actor is, and uh, isn't totally not stepping on their toes or encroaching, because you know little things like that, or like with the background, hey, I noticed a group of backgrounds stepped away to the bathroom, or hey, I saw them pillaging Crafty somewhere. Um, you know, stepping in to help out like that is uh is worthwhile so other things you'll do as a key set pa aside from setting the lockups organizing the vans uh so between the days when you're making moves in between sets being in communication with the teamsters 
giving them estimates and updates of what you guys are doing on set and also dividing up vans, which is going to be more important now because you can only have so many people in a van. Um, day by day, when I worked as a key set PA, I would kind of meet with the second second at night and kind of go over the day a little bit here and there and talk about the moves and the major uh, things that needed to happen and would take notes and kind of divvy up the work um, for the next day if it was a big day and not just a simple day at the stage um, as to who's doing what during the day and who can help. So we already had the plan ready to go. So I say planning is a good part of it too. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, we could spend an hour just talking about right. being a QSAT PA. There's lots of other things like always stick with a camera, know where the director is, be where the first TD is, it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Erica, can you talk a little bit about um, being a first team or production assistant responsible for cast and their movements on set, specifically yeah, on set? On set, yeah. yeah. Um, so when you're a cast PA or first team PA, uh, first team refers to the cast. Uh, Second team, never mind. I'm not going to get into it. I don't feel like it. That's okay. Second team are the stand-ins. They're the lighting. They're the extras that are hired specifically to be stand-ins, and we use them to light and rehearse. And they oftentimes will tell the actors when they arrive what the cameras are doing. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I didn't have the energy. Um, so with uh, being a first team PA, uh, you're responsible for the cast while they're on set. So you are making sure once they arrive, you're in constant communication with base camp, which is where they get ready. Uh, once they arrive, you know where their chairs are, where they can sit while they're waiting for the scene to start. Um, you are responsible for making sure they go uh, to the sound cart to make sure they get wired, um, letting them know and the, um, the hair and makeup team know what is up next, what are we going to be seeing next, who is going to be um in the shot some uh hair and makeup aren't on walkies so it's your responsibility co to communicate with them all right this is going to be a tight shot on uh on john so this other person you may not need to touch up but we have to make sure that john's face is ready to have a camera right in it um so uh little pieces like that um as well as when you're communicating with first team i feel like that's that's a big um, yeah, how do you tell the actors we need them to stop having a conversation, put their <laughs> mic on, and go to set because the AD is yelling in my ear? How do you do that with somebody who's, you know, on billboards and stuff? Sure. Uh, yeah, it, it can be intimidating at first, but ultimately you're their line of communication to the production. So that way they don't seem to be any sort of way. They don't know what's going on. They're, they're there to do the job and you have to help them do their job by getting them to where they need to be. So just a polite, uh, you know, get in the corner of their eye if they're having a conversation, make yourself, make your presence known and saying, uh, hey, John, don't mean to interrupt. We are ready for you on set. Um, it's just a polite, while well, the screaming is going on and they can probably hear it at this point, it's so loud. Uh, you are calm, cool and collected. Excuse me, sir, we are ready for you on set. Um, giving them a heads up. Hey, we have about five minutes before we're gonna start rolling keeping them updated so that way they know, all right, five minutes, now I have time to go to the bathroom. Hopefully they're not going as soon as we call for them. Little things like that. Uh, they are people and they're there to do a job. And that's the important thing to remember is that even when they're not on in a scene acting at the very moment we're rolling, they're remembering their lines, they're getting into character. You can't just sit there and have a conversation with them all the time. You know, you are, you're there to help them do a job and they're constantly working. Um, so being respectful and mindful of that, Dan, go. You're on uh, mute. Okay. To, to Erica's point, there's a wonderful book um, called We're Ready When You Are, Mr. Kepler, uh, Mr. <laughs> Spielberg, that was written by an AD who worked for a long time. But I found that phrase, um, they're ready for you or we're ready when you are, mm -hmm. is a very helpful uh, way to speak to cast and to directors um, also just sort of being deferential to their position of authority like it sounds silly but just you know knocking hey five minute estimate the van's ready when you are and then if you're being asked to push them hopefully as a PA your AD is going to step in hopefully if you're in base camp the key second AD is going to be the bad cop for lack of a better term or the additional AD in base camp is going to be a 
um, I cut you off, Erica. So did you have anything else or should we switch to base camp? You wanna? No, you're, you're good. I could talk about cast all day. We can talk about, I mean, part of what you're doing is also getting them wired with sound and, and whatever. And, and we'll talk about this briefly in a minute here when we get on to like new rules with COVID, but some of what we're talking about is even more, yeah. as an additional PA, you may not have any part of it. So um, Jordan, can you talk about base camp and what a base camp PA would do and how that would work if there's an additional AD and if there isn't? I would love to. Um, I also wanted to mention something that um, someone told me when I first started in base camp actually is um, as much as you want them to be the cast aren't really there to be your friend. Um, it's definitely a good thing to keep a line there. They are we do as PAs, especially as an additional PA we work for them. We're there for them. We're there to help them. Um, so keep that in mind. Don't try to become their best friend. Um, definitely a co-working relationship to, um, to focus on that. Um, as for a base camp PA, which is where I started, um, you are in charge of receiving the cast when they arrive to base camp. Um, you help them get to their trailer. You help them get the food they need. Oftentimes when they arrive in the morning, we will give them breakfast. Um, and then we make sure that they are in the hair makeup trailer on time. We make sure that they have all the clothes they need. Um, make sure that costumes is aware when people are changing. Oftentimes they want to be, you know, there to help them, especially for women that have more intricate costumes. Um, yeah, as a, I started, this is actually my first job as a base camp AD. Um, I do very similar things, but I do a little bit more paperwork now um, that I have you know, the DGA responsibility and the liability. Um, but as a PA, it's, it's a really good gig. It's, it's nice. You get to learn. Um, it's a good place to be if you are interested in second AD. Um, you have a little bit of op opportunity to learn the paperwork side of things. Um, but yeah, your main, your main responsibilities are getting the cast to set and making sure they're ready. Anybody? Can you, any? can you just briefly talk about what a production report is and and how you might be asked to prep that? Absolutely. So production report, as Tyler said, is a legal document. It is a report of what happened on the production that day, hence the name. Um, as a base camp PA or a base camp AD, I always prep the PR, prep the PR, um, which is I go through and I put, it looks basically like a call sheet. You put in what scenes you just shot that day, um, I put in the actors, um, the exhibit G is what we call the actor's time card. Um, so I make sure all that information is in there and that's correct for their payment purposes. And then we do all the times on the back for all the crew, um, which is what those daily sheets that Tyler mentioned earlier are for. Um, yeah. Jordan is the queen of Doxzilla. She had sure. to help me is... learn Doxzilla on the last show, which is... Fox, uh, some, some shows have it online. You have to do it online. And it's very frustrating because sometimes it refreshes guy. and you lose all your information. I love paperwork. It's super fun. <laughs> yeah, if you, don't, if you don't like Excel and paperwork and math and accounting, then don't be in the AD department. Um, but you don't have to be great at it. It's true. You don't, you, there are, listen, <laughs> there are a lot of first ADs who are who never used Excel in their life and never will. Um, okay. I just want to briefly touch on base camp because I think it's an important part of it is dealing with hair, makeup and wardrobe um, and sort of being again, um, taking the position like they're not your buddies, but they're not the enemy. Um, and, and remembering that, you know, as ADs, how may we be of service? We're here to help. If you take the approach of like, uh, hey, makeup artist, you know, I'm hearing that we are going to be ready for the cast at this time how does that sound to you? That's a lot softer of a delivery than we need them in 15 minutes, get your shit together. So just remembering that you have to balance the working relationship in base camp, which no one on set sees, but also deliver the cast when needed. And again, your second AD should be a large part of that. If like something doesn't go right, they should be the ones to step in and take responsibility and adjust the times for the next day. And, and hopefully if you're working as a PA in base camp, you're not being let out to dry by your second AD. But. Hopefully. 
Sometimes um, it happens. I would like to mention that as an additional PA, you usually won't be asked to go into the hair makeup trailer, especially when there's cast in there. Um, sometimes you might be asked to just relay, you know, certain information, but usually the base camp PA or the base camp AD uh, will be in charge of actually doing communicating and going in the trailer. Um, we do like to keep the trailer, the hair makeup trailer is what I'm speaking of, um, a, a serene place for the actors. We like to keep it nice and calm. Oftentimes hair makeup, you know, they'll always have music on and stuff. So they like to, you know, don't, if you do go into the trailer, um, don't bring a lot of like set energy with you. Um, they definitely like, you know, I like to approach it as a, hey guys, you know, everything's going good. You know, we're gonna be ready for you in 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's all. <laughs> uh, all right, in the interest of time, we will just briefly say that there's another PA position, which is usually called radio distro PA. So Rich, can you briefly talk about if you're in charge of radios on a show, what the distro part of that job is and what that means and how you might be able to be responsible for paperwork? Yeah, so uh, basically with the distro part of that job, you essentially, you have a little kit that you keep with all the essential paperwork that people need. So you're gonna have call sheets, you're gonna have sides which is just small versions of the what we're doing for the day it's like a smaller version of the script you're going to be in charge of you know having uh, time cards just any paperwork that the crew may or may not need you just want to have extra and have you know abundance of it that you have available to you and the crew sometimes you might even have just blank you know paper for uh you know for just whatever needs uh distro is it's like a large, I guess, um, there's a large variety of things that you have when you're doing distro. I find that you start off with a small kit. Eventually, before the end of the show, that kit is like massive and you have you've amassed so much that you don't know what to do with it. Uh, you have pens, you have paper clips. There's, you know, just whatever you can possibly think of that the crew may need, even the most minuscule thing, you'll probably have in your kit at some point. Um, you also, with that, you want to know who everyone is. So you have papers that specifically go to certain people. So you might have like, I don't know, maybe I got some distro in for the producer. I sh it's my job to know who that producer is and whether I should give the distro directly to that producer or to their assistant or you know whoever that is dealing directly with the producer is the person that I have to go to. Um, I guess with that being said, like, it's just, uh, I don't know. I'm getting tongue tied, tongue tied right now. It's okay. I'm so much, but I um... think, like <laughs> to touch on what Rich is saying, base camp. So there's a distro at the office. The production office right. has a box that says to set, and they're constantly throwing things in there in envelopes and labeling them to the second AC, to the UPM, to the first AD, whatever. Script revisions come out, new schedules come out. Who knows? The actor asks the office to order them something on Amazon. It could be camera needs batteries, whatever it is. It's going to come in a transpo van in a big box and they're either going to dump it in base camp with the base camp PA or they're going to dump it on set with the radio distro PA. And then those two PAs, the radio distro PA and the base camp PA have to figure out how to get the things to the right place. So either to base camp or to set and then get it all out to everybody. And it's always a team effort. You know, if you're a PA, you may get asked to help here, take this stuff over to the grip truck or whatever, because inevitably people want their stuff and the office is like hey why didn't you hand that out all right um exactly. uh dan just to add to that basically yes, you're, you're the on-set mailman that's what i like to call it there you go and when, whenever i'm like delivering stuff i'm always like hey i got your meal guys and like people love that you know, i think the biggest thing to know if you're going to be a distro pa is don't let stuff sit just get it out exactly if you got to get it out three as soon as friends possible. to get it out just get it out mm -hmm. uh okay so there's a there's a background pa that sort of works with the ad's to check in background and get them to set um, we're going to move on from PA roles and just kind of talk briefly about COVID guidelines. Just very briefly, we'll just go around 30 seconds or one minute each and just talk about it. So I will say if you um, are looking to get into production right now, you should familiarize yourself with the Safe Way Forward, which is a document that was made by the DGA, uh, the Camera Union, IATSE, and Screen Actors Guild. You can just Google that. It's out there. You should read that and familiarize yourself with it. But bottom line is know what job you're being hired on. If it's a studio network show or an indie movie or commercial or a documentary, they're all going to have different levels of safety plans. 
please do not be shy about asking what the safety plan is. Make sure the job you're getting hired on has a COVID safety officer. Um, make sure that you're wearing a mask and that you have your own personal hand sanitizer. And just, if you don't feel safe, don't take the job. If you don't think that they're taking it seriously and you don't feel comfortable, you know, your safety is your responsibility ultimately. So with that being said, I will open up to the panel, some of whom are on shows right now that can talk more in detail. Yeah, I mean, uh, Rich and I are, are on Fargo right now, and that's really the only union thing that's shooting in Chicago. Um, and we have a health and safety department, uh, and they're responsible for having all the PPE, the masks, the hand sanitizer, face shields, goggles. Um, and they have PAs as well and two medics, at least our, our, we have two medics, um, to make sure that we're able to cover absolutely everything. Um, as far as PAs go in this time, we're there to help them as well. So if you see somebody with their mask on their chin or if you see that, uh, if somebody hands you like, Rich can probably touch on this, sanitizing walkie batteries and, and different things like that, just trying to help spread uh, as much cleanliness as possible, um, having extra masks on you, having hand sanitizer and wipes on you just to be helpful. Um, and I mean, we're getting tested three times a week. It's, uh, I mean, I haven't felt unsafe yet. No, it's been pretty safe set for the most part. Like nobody's, nobody's been sick, which is great. Yeah. We've already got one week in bag. We have one more week to go. Um, things have been good. Like, I, like Erica was saying, you just want to make sure you sanitize and keep things clean. Like, I find myself, sometimes I'll just spray a doorknob with sanitizer because people are going in and out of the door. You know, everyone's touching it. Uh, I'll have sanitizer. I'll have extra masks, like she said. I'll have, uh, we, so people in zone A are required to wear face masks or goggles. Uh, I'll have extra goggles on me or I'll have an extra face mask in case, you know, somebody loses theirs, in case one breaks or, you know, a person just forgot it that's something that got added to my kit that I didn't start with. And that's the whole thing with the distro. Like I said, you always get something extra that you didn't think about, or, you know, it just somehow have happened to fall in your lap. So you just want to make sure with the COVID guidelines, like you're staying socially distant, like you, you interact with people, but you make sure like you keep those interactions short. And that way, like you're not, you know, within that, what they call the, that zone or that space for too long to where you can spread the disease if you do have it, but nobody on our set has had it, which is great. Uh, the testing that we do, we do it what, at least three times a week, like you said. Yeah. Uh, the, the health and safety team have been great. They, they provide you with pretty much anything that you can think of as far as like this COVID safety. And it's, it's, it's a weird process, but like we've, like I said, we have a week down, so we're, we're getting used to it now. Uh, another week, and we'll be pros. <laughs> I just want to I just want to briefly counterbalance what Erica and Rich are saying. I also shared in the chat the AICP, which is the Association of Independent Commercial Producers. They have their own guidelines. Uh, for example, I'm working on DGA jobs that are union jobs, but they're commercials. They're not a show, so they have a different set of standards, which does not include the robust testing protocols that Erica and Rich are speaking about. Which goes to my point as like take whatever job you're taking and know what you're taking. So we're following all the same guidelines with PPE and sanitizer and all that, but we're not being tested. So if you're taking a job and they're not testing people, just know what you're getting into and take it knowingly. And I will say that backpacks have become even more essential. Throw some extra masks in there and some, mm -hmm. get some stuff from the health and safety department, extra wipes and uh, hand sanitizer, gloves, and I was on a job where we were doing a car job and we were all over the place and how could craft service get everybody water and it was hot. We craft service put water bottles in pre-sealed Ziploc bags, put them in PA backpacks, PAs had gloves. Here's your water bottle. And in a, in a, I mean, it sounds silly, but like that's what we had to do. So just sort of every job is a little different. Jordan, can you talk about what Chicago Med, what they're planning to do? Yeah, um, so everything changes every day. <laughs> um, but so far, uh, we are testing our zone A people um, five times a week. So we're doing a partial of the rapid testing, like, which I think is ready in like 15 minutes or something, and then part of the 24 hour turnaround testing. Um, and then we have these new fancy electrostatic cleaner backpacks. 
um, that apparently when you spray them, I think they probably look like the water sprayers of some sort. Um, and whenever I you think spray it's what them, they use to clean like airplanes and dentist office. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have those and we're going to have uh, special Ghostbuster PAs that are going to get to wear them. <laughs> so uh, we're also doing staggered lunches. I think we're doing three waves of different lunches to keep people socially distanced. Um, we are doing longer episodes. So usually pre-COVID, we would do eight day episodes and now we're doing 10 day episodes with 10 hour days. Um, uh, we are hiring extra staff PAs and you are getting... Um, temperature checks from the Cinespace security before you can even enter the Cinespace campus, which is really nice. Um, I think personally that this is gonna really benefit our industry, honestly. I think it's gonna really make us more crew focused. I'm excited. Yeah, I would say to, to add to that, that the some of the changes like we're, aside from some call sheets and some sides, we're completely paperless now. Um, everything is online, uh, which makes it a little bit easier for us as PAs, but it's, you know, less passing, um, vans where normally 14 would fill a van depends on the show, but for Fargo, we can only have them at half capacity. So including the driver, seven people, um, and, uh, we Ours have ordered three. Yeah. Three people in a van at a time. Chicago Med doesn't travel as much easier uh, as well. So it's, it's a little bit easier there, I think. Um, and then uh, everything, as far as parking goes, everything's within a five minute distance from set. So even if we are in a van, you're only in there for about five minutes max. Um, so there are a lot of things that are helpful in lockups. Uh, it's so great uh, for strangers walking by, you can't come on set because you might have a coronavirus please don't come near us uh so that's been helpful uh to keep people away um little things tyler do you have anything briefly you want to add to this segment hey if you're if you're sick stay home if you're feeling sick let your boss know i don't think any good ad is going to fault you for admitting that and just going home it's keeping everyone else safe and you know they'll get you on another day i certainly wouldn't uh, fault anyone if you called me last minute hey i'm not feeling well just so, gotta be safe together there's a question in the chat that i think or in the q a that i think will lead us to a summary here and touch on what jordan is saying what is the biggest difference post covid how has this changed the mood on set um, i would say that safety has always been a concern in our industry we can spend a whole afternoon talking about it um, but the coronavirus has presented us with an opportunity to put that health and safety element of what we do at the forefront, um, especially in the States, we have a, like a work ethic in production. It's sort of like this, like everybody works long days and just slog it out kind of mentality. And I think that the coronavirus has asked everybody to reimagine what a film set should look and feel like. And this idea of having the whole crew kind of crawling on top of each other, sweating and exhausted. Maybe we need to like Jordan is saying, slow down, take a minute, add time to our schedule, reimagine how we can do things. Um, I don't want us to leave this chat without talking about the very important things that we have not touched on in our last few minutes, which is um, people want to know how to break in, how to get job as a PA. Um, before we get into that, there was two things briefly that I just want to say out loud. Somebody asked about working with other departments and how you do that as a PA. I think we touched on that, but just generally speaking, saying that, telling those departments that you're curious, asking questions about their, how they do their job when there's time for it. And I would just say, please don't do that at the expense of the ADs that hired you or the key set PA that hired you or the production coordinator that hired you, because that certainly will not get you back. We've all worked with those PAs who are like, I'm a DP. I'm going to, I'm shooting my movie tomorrow or, Hey, I directed this thing or, Hey, I wrote this thing. No one is telling you that you won't be successful, but in the role that you're in knowing how and when to have that communication with those departments is like, do your job first, let them do their job first and let them know, Hey, I don't have anything to do right now. I'm here to support you if you need it. It's a little harder on a union show than a non-union show, but you can get hired in certain capacities as a costume PA or a camera PA or, you know, a sound utility, it, it does happen. So um, 
as far as how you get into the industry, let's all just go around. I will say my first job I got on Craigslist. Um, also know like there are other job listing sites. We can maybe put them in the chat. Uh, if you know other people who are working as a PA, get on one job and then meet those PAs and then bug those PAs because you know, that's how you get hired. It's, it's who you know, but it's also who knows you more importantly. And I'll just close by saying personally, we're all only as good as our last day on set. So if you show up and you give 110%, usually that gets noticed and it'll usually get you hired again. Uh, all right, so we just go around real quick and talk about how we got in and, and suggestions for people on how to find work. Sure. Uh, so I first started working on um, movies when they had need for 50 to 100 PAs to do big lockups. And that's how I um, got involved. And same thing, met some friends that took me on the next project and then the next project and the next project because I, you know, I was there, I showed up, um, you know, I think there are still a few pages on Facebook. I think there was one mm -hmm. called Staff Me Up Chicago. I don't know if they're still running, but they were pretty good at posting listings, even for um, student things and, and you know, non-union things to get involved with. I'd say get involved, um, if you're still in school, get involved in some student films because a lot of people work on passion projects that work in the industry that you'll meet that you, know, you can make a connection with uh, too. Absolutely. Um, I am from Oklahoma and I went to school for theater. Um, so I knew I wanted to get into film, but I didn't know how, obviously I'm from Oklahoma. Um, so I, um, emailed a professor that I didn't have anything going on in the summer and I was looking for some kind of internship and I was interested in theater or film. And she sent me an email for a, um, a fellow student who was working on a on a personal passion project and I just kind of stalked her through email and I emailed her every week and said hey just you know interested in this let me know if you need any help more than happy to work for no pay whatever I can do and um, she eventually I think got annoyed with me and sent my information to the producers and I got a job and uh, same thing from there I met some people you know I was really excited I was gung-ho took initiative and um, got noticed so I got taken on a couple more jobs in Oklahoma, and then I moved up here um, as soon as I finished school. So, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I was in, I came from, I'm from Boston. I don't know why I had so much trouble saying that. Uh, I'm from Boston, and uh, there were a couple times when I happened upon film sets, and I would ask them, and it, it, it's a perfectly good way to make a connection is to talk with the PA that's in a lockup, honestly. Um, I got called for that, and I was too afraid, and I didn't do it. Um, but when I decided to move to Chicago, a friend of mine reached out to her sister and her sister knew a PA on Chicago Med and he gave me some contacts to reach out to. And, um, from there I emailed them my resume and, you know, said I was interested my first day was on, on Chicago Med. Um, but yeah, once you're there, it's all about taking initiative and, uh, asking questions and being proactive and that just shows that you're interested and willing to learn and being a part of it as opposed to someone who's just there because they think it's really cool to I don't know, see actors or something. Um, so yeah. Cool. I started off as an extra. Um, I did that on a whim and ended up being an extra. I met Tyler on my, like one of my second extra gigs. And then I ended up meeting him again on another show as an extra. And I expressed that I wanted to be a PA to him and some other uh, PAs on the show. And eventually they got me my first day and I've been doing it ever since. And you do a great job, kiddo. Thank you. <laughs> do you right, anybody this one, Dan? Want to run? Um, okay. Came up with you talk a little bit about union versus non-union. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just say that like there are hundreds of different jobs out there. Most of our experience here is in film and television. Um, but as you opportunity, you find yourself on a documentary, a music video, a commercial, a web series, uh, somebody's bar mitzvah video, whatever. Um, again, just take it, take into consideration your own health and safety. Know what it is you're being hired on to do. Do not put yourself in any position where you're going to be exploited. If you're on a job where people are being compensated, you need to be compensated at least with the minimum wage. Um, 
and Jordan mentioned internships. That's a big thing you can do. I would say cold calling or emailing production, commercial production companies, or there's a lot of post houses in Chicago if you're interested in post. And, um, you know, it doesn't hurt if you can find out that there's a production office opening up for a show and you want to send your resume to the info at whatever, you never know whose desk it's going to come across. And um, yeah, when I first moved to Chicago, um, I worked with an AD in Oklahoma who lived here and he just sent me a crew list from a show he'd worked on. And I just sat down one day and I sent 51 emails. I sent emails to every PA, every AD, um, the art department because I did production design in school. I sent emails to whoever I thought would be interested. And I ended up getting, you know, asked to PA, you know, day play PA on the APB pilot. Um, so yeah, you just have to, you have to be a self starter and you have to really, you know, keep in contact with people you meet. That's how you're gonna get your next job. And always be available. That's my other to chime in on that. Like, just be available. When you're first starting in the industry, like, if, if someone calls you, yes, you're available. Whatever the job is, like, just, yes, I can be there. Like, that's, that happened for me. Like, I was just, I was working a regular job before I started PA stuff. And then um, it, it was interfering with me getting PA jobs because I was just like, oh, I can't today. My job is telling me that I can't, you know. So eventually... Like I had to make a decision whether I wanted to, you know, try to go for this 100% or if I was just going to leave it alone. So I was just, I quit my job. I'm not saying that it's the right thing to do, but for me, it helped. So mm -hmm. I quit my job and I told him, I told everyone immediately, like, hey, I'm available every day. And I got called every day. And I mean, just to echo what Rich is saying, like, again, work your network. If somebody hires you, I mean, don't text them every day, but you can email somebody and say, it was really great working for you. Mm -hmm. I'm around if you need anybody, especially the other PAs. Hey man, thanks for all the pointers. If you guys need additionals, I'm around. If you get called for something, you can't do it, I'm around. Kristen in the chat is asking us to briefly talk a little bit about union versus non-union. And I will just say that there are plenty of people who have established themselves in departments who are not members of the union. Um, as speaking as a member of the Directors Guild of America, I. I'm all for organized labor. I think it does a lot for everybody. It cr creates rules and it provides pay structure. Um, obviously, as you're establishing yourself, you're gonna take the jobs you can take. If you can get hired as a non-union second AC and make the same money you would make as a PA or a little bit more, then like, you should do that. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Everyone has done that. And I think that working as a PA on bigger shows and then also pursuing whatever you're passionate about, whether that's being an AD or being a grip or a sound person on non-union things or low budget things simultaneously will benefit you and will make you very much more quickly able to move up in the world that is union, if that helps. I would, I would say is being a PA responsibilities are much different on something that's non-union versus union. Uh, union production, you're not going to be asked to use any heavy equipment or move anything that's not a table or a chair, but on a non-union thing, you could be asked to drive a cargo van. You could be asked to operate other equipment, not, not a forklift necessarily, but you know, they might ask, have you driven a 10 ton before or not, or um, what's the one smaller than that? A cube like, truck. Like on commercials, a lot of times the production assistants will get asked to drive cube trucks. They'll drive the right. cargo vans, pass vans. Um, it's much more common that you'll get like a, an art assist PA or a costume assist PA or whatever on a commercial, even if it's a union commercial, because there's just different distinctions in terms of what the Teamsters do on commercials versus movies and TV. So, um, and just I, because you want to get into bigger productions, don't, don't think you need to turn down the indie jobs or the non-union jobs. I did a lot of non-union jobs coming up. Um, and I, and I actually really liked it. I found it really beneficial because on non-union jobs, you get to have your hand in a few more pies. I think you have more responsibilities like Tyler said. Um, and it's, and it's really nice to get to see how other departments work. Um, which I think really benefited me coming onto a union show. I kind of knew what everybody's jobs were and I knew, and, and, and starting on a non-union gig, there was a little bit more flexibility for me to ask questions and learn. So don't feel like just because you want to work on bigger stuff that you shouldn't take the smaller jobs because you definitely have more freedom to learn on them, I would think. I think that's an excellent point. Like I was working as a commercial PA primarily and um, an AD sort of, I was like, I want to be an AD. And she was like, well, here, take this non-union indie movie. Basically, you're going to get paid a PA rate. You're going to be a second, second AD, but you're going to get paid PA rate. 
And I was yep. like, oh, this is great. And you know, it was like a horror movie with like a fifty thousand dollar budget or something. But like, I, <laughs> I got to get my hands dirty to Jordan's point. And I will just add now that we're in the global pandemic, if you're going to take those jobs see earlier our point about asking what their safety plan is because obviously they're not going to have the same resources that a Fargo is going to have but someone who's in charge should still be thinking about your safety so mm -hmm. please make sure you're asking those questions it's a it's an interesting time to be starting out so just um yeah, yeah. I will say thanks to everybody for listening and for being here as a reminder this is going to be on YouTube and I will hand it back over to Kevin thanks Kevin you know, uh, I, I'm just going to chime in here quickly and say, uh, you know, I've been in the film industry for, for uh, over 18 years. Uh, I started as a PA in the early aughts and uh, have uh, become a producer. And, and what this panel just told you guys is some really, really great stuff. Um, really impressed with, uh, with the, the information that, that they were able to, to get out to you guys in the last hour and a half. So, uh, I know that a lot of this stuff came at you really fast. And if you haven't been on set before, um, some of it may have been a little bit confusing, but we are going to have this up on the, uh, on the YouTube channel uh, at some point in the next few days. So you guys can go back and rewatch this and, and get a little more of that information. Uh, also, there's just a little bit of time left for the, um, the virtual uh, trade show floor uh, to be open. Of course, that will still uh, th there will still be all of that information at uh, filmscapechicago.com uh, afterwards. Uh, and I, I thank you guys for uh, for coming out and uh, and enjoying hopefully uh, this panel. I think it was extremely extremely uh, well well done, and uh, any of the other panels that you may have seen during Filmscape. So thanks very much, everybody who joined us. And uh, unless Dan and, and the panel has, has anything else they'd like to say, we'll, uh, we'll say goodbye for now. Uh, I'll just say thanks for having us. And um, good luck to all the future production assistants out there. We'll see you on set. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. See you guys.